In this video, we're going to talk about capacitors. So what exactly is a capacitor? A capacitor stores electrical charge. It's not the same as a battery. A capacitor uses two metal plates separated by an insulator. And it basically stores charge by taking electrons from one side and pumping it towards the other side. The insulator it could be air, it could be paper, it could be water. Anything that doesn't conduct electricity could be the insulator. So that's basically what a capacitor is. It's made of two metal plates separated by an insulator, and it stores electrical charge. Now there are some equations that you need to be familiar with. Q is equal to CV. Q stands for the charge. And the electric charge is measured in the unit's coulombs. One coulomb is equal to one amp times one second. So Q is equal to IT, where I is the electric current in amps, T is the time in seconds. Now C represents the capacitance. And the capacitance is measured in farads. V is the voltage, measured in volts. So what exactly is capacitance? How can we describe it? I like to think of capacitance in terms of charge efficiency. One farad is equal to one coulomb per volt. So let's say if we have two capacitors. One has a, a capacitance of 10 farads, and the other one has a capacitance of 2 farads. Let's call the first one capacitor A, and the second one capacitor B. Now, if we charge up capacitor A to a voltage of, let's say, 1 volt, it can store 10 coulombs of charge. For capacitor B, if we charge it up to 1 volt, it can only store 2 coulombs of charge. Now, what if we increase the voltage? Let's say if we charge up to 2 volts. Capacitor A can hold 20 coulombs of charge. Capacitor B, if we charge it up to 2 volts, if we connect it to a 2 volt battery, it can hold up to 4 coulombs of charge. So as you can see, capacitance is basically charge efficiency. It's how much charge you can hold per volt. As you increase the voltage, you can hold more charge. But if you look at capacitor A, it's more efficient. It can hold 10 coulombs of charge per 1 volt, whereas capacitor B can only hold 2 coulombs of charge per volt. So the higher capacitance means that you can store more charge per volt. Now, Q is equal to CV. If you increase the voltage, the charge will increase, as you can see here. However, if you increase the voltage, the capacitance doesn't increase. The capacitance is based on the construction of the capacitor. It doesn't depend on the voltage. So make sure you understand that the capacitance is constant, and it only depends on the construction of the capacitor. Now, going back to the equation Q equals CV, let's talk about electric charge. You need to understand that electric charge is associated with the quantity of charged particles. And in the case of metals, electrons are basically the charge carriers. They're the ones that are free to move inside a metal. The protons are fixed in place. So the electric charge is equal to the number of electrons times the charge of each electron. Now, the charge of each electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So this charge is discrete. That's the lowest charge that an electron can have. Every electron has that charge. You can't have a charge that's less than this number, unless you have a fraction of an electron. So charge is quantized. Now, you need to know that the unit volt is one joule per coulomb. 
electric potential, represented by V, is basically the ratio between the electric potential energy and the charge Q. Now, be careful. Electric potential and voltage are not necessarily the same thing, but they're similar. Voltage is the difference in the electric potentials of two points. So voltage is delta V. It's the change in electric potential. VB is the electric potential at position B. VA is the electric potential at position A. So electric potential is the electric potential energy per charge. Now, electric potential and voltage, they're both measured in volts. So it's joules per column, which is one volt. Voltage is basically the ratio between the work and the charge. It's the amount of work that can be done per unit charge. So work is equal to Q delta V. And I believe there's a negative sign somewhere. Now let's get back to capacitance. We said that the unit of capacitance is the farad. One farad is a very, very large number. And only supercapacitors have this much capacitance. Most common capacitors that you may see, like electrolytic capacitors, they might be in the area of a microfarad. It could be 10, 100 microfarads. You have some capacitors that are like nanofarads, and even some in the picofarad level. A microfarad is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 frads. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. Pico is 10 to the minus 12. Now, there's another equation that you need to know. C is equal to epsilon sub naught times A divided by D. We said that the capacitance is basically a measure. It's basically, it's dependent on the construction of the capacitor. So let's draw a capacitor. Here we have two metal plates separated by a distance D. Each plate has an area A, and for a rectangle, area is just the length times width. The capacitance depends on the area. If you increase the area, the capacitance of the capacitor will increase because you can store more charge over a larger surface. Now, if you increase the distance, the capacitance will decrease. Given the same amount of charge, if you increase the distance, then the strength of the electric field between the two plates will decrease. And therefore, the electric force acting on the charges in between the plates, if there is a charge, will be weaker. And also the capacitance will go down as well. So make sure you understand this. If you increase the area, the capacitance will increase. If you de increase the distance, the capacitance will decrease. Now, sometimes you can add an insulator. The insulator doesn't have to be air. And if you add an insulator, also known as a dielectric, the equation will change. C will be equal to K times epsilon times A over D. Now, let's not forget this little zero here. So K is the dielectric constant. And for air, K is about 1.0006. It's very small, very close to 1. For a pure vacuum where there's nothing, no gas molecules, K is exactly 1. For other substances, K will increase. For example, let's say if we have uh, quartz. For this material, K is about 4.3. In the case of water, K is about 80. Now, what effect does the dielectric have on the capacitance? As you increase K, the capacitance will increase. So it's very useful to use a dielectric. You can store more charge per volt. C is equal to K times C sub naught. 
where C sub naught is the original capacitance without a dielectric, and C is the capacitance with the dielectric. So anytime you add a dielectric, the capacitance will go up. However, the voltage will go down. V is equal to the original voltage divided by K. So let's say if you have a capacitor that has uh, 10 frads, and let's say the voltage across it is 20 volts, and the dielectric is 1. Let's say there's air in between it. Now, let's say if we add a material and the dielectric has a, a constant of 2. I mean, the uh, insulator has a dielectric constant of 2. The capacitance will increase to 20, but the voltage will decrease to 10. So by increasing the dielectric, you will increase the capacitance, but you will decrease the voltage proportionally. But notice that the total charge remains the same. Now, you have to do this when the capacitor is charged but not connected to a battery. Because if you decrease the voltage of a capacitor, and if it's connected to a battery, then charge will flow from the battery to the capacitor, bringing its voltage back up to 20. So you have to charge the capacitor first. Let's say if it's charged to a voltage of 20, then disconnect the battery and the capacitor, and then add the dielectric. When you add the dielectric, when the capacitor is not connected to the battery, the charge of the capacitor will remain the same. The capacitance will increase with the new dielectric, but the voltage will decrease. So Q equals CV. Notice that if we multiply 10 by 20, we're going to get a charge of 200. And that is 200 coulombs. If we multiply 20 by 10, we will still get the same charge of 200 coulombs. So by adding a dielectric to a charged capacitor when it's not connected to a battery, the capacitance will increase and the voltage will decrease. Now I do want to mention something. The equation that we had that I drew on a board that looked like this, this is the capacitance of a capacitor if a vacuum is used as a dielectric, if there's nothing in between the two metal plates. Now, the equation changes to this if you have a dielectric. It's going to be epsilon times A over D. Epsilon sub naught is the permittivity of free space. It's 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 Coulomb squared per Newton per square meter. So make sure you know that value because you're going to use it a lot. Now, the other epsilon without the zero is simply the permittivity of the material between the two uh, parallel plates. Now, epsilon is equal to k times epsilon sub naught. So therefore, we have this equation. C is equal to k times epsilon sub naught times A over D. That is, if you replace epsilon with k epsilon sub naught. So this equation is the capacitance of a capacitor if there's nothing in between the two metal plates. If you have a dielectric, then the capacitance can be calculated using that equation. Now let's talk about how to derive the formula for a capacitor. So let's draw the picture of a capacitor. Here are the two metal plates. One of the plates is going to have a positive charge, and the other plate is going to be negatively charged. And so there's going to be an electric field that flows from the positive plate and points towards the negative plate. And these two plates are separated by a distance d. Now, you can calculate the electric field if you know the voltage across the capacitor and if you know the distance between the two plates. The electric field is simply the voltage divided by the separation distance. Now, the electric field is also equal to the surface charge density sigma divided by epsilon sub naught. 
and the surface charge density is basically the total charge on that plate divided by the area of the plate. So starting with the equation Q equals CV, our goal is to solve for C. So C is Q divided by V. And rearranging this equation, if we multiply both sides by A, we can see that Q is equal to, that does not look like a Q, Q is equal to the surface charge density sigma times the area. So let's replace Q with sigma times A. Now, using this equation, if we solve for voltage, voltage is equal to the electric field times the separation distance. So it's E times D. Now, using the equation in the middle, if we solve for sigma, sigma, the surface charge density, is equal to the electric field times the permittivity of free space. So let's replace it with that. So E times epsilon sub naught times A divided by E over times D is equal to the capacitance. So now we can cancel C. So therefore, the capacitance depends on the area and the separation distance. So that's how you can derive the equation. Now, how does a capacitor work? How does a battery charge a capacitor? Well, let's draw a picture. So let's draw the two metal plates of a capacitor. And let's connect it to a battery. This is a circuit diagram of a battery. The long side of a battery is the positive terminal. The short side is the negative terminal. So this is negative, and this side is positive. Now, before you connect the battery, if the capacitor is discharged, it's going to have a voltage of zero. And let's connect it to a 12 volt battery. Once you connect it, there's a difference in potential. Whenever you have a difference in electric potential, the voltage is not zero. Current is going to flow. If the voltage is zero, then no electric current will flow. One way you can think about this is, let's say if you have a level surface, and if you have water on this surface, this water will not flow. The height between position A and position B is the same. However, let's say if you increase the uh, angle. Let's say if you uh, put on an incline. And let's say A is at a higher position than B. Then water is going to flow from the high position to the low position. And the more you increase the angle, the greater the velocity. It's going, the water is going to flow down with more acceleration, with more force. The same is true with voltage. If the voltage is zero between two points, that is if the electric potential is zero between two points, no current will flow. Current flows from a high electric potential to a low electric potential. The same way as water flows from a high position to a low position. So while the capacitor have a voltage of zero, current is going to flow in a circuit. Now initially, before we connect the battery at T equals zero, the charge on the two plates is zero. The number of electrons and protons are equal. Now let's say that on the first plate there's about a thousand electrons, which means that there's a thousand protons for it to be neutral. In reality it's probably much more than that. You have like billions and billions of electrons and protons. But let's keep it simple. So we have a thousand electrons and a thousand protons. And on the other side we also have a thousand electrons and a thousand protons. Now in a metal, the protons they don't move, but the electrons they're free to move. So keep that in mind. Now once you attach the battery to the capacitor, which the capacitor has a voltage of zero, because there's a difference in electric potential, current will flow. Now mind you, current doesn't flow in between the two metal plates of the capacitor because you have an insulator there. And insulators do not conduct electricity. Conductors conduct electricity. So the electrons, they will flow 
from one side to the other side. Now, because this side has a positive charge, the electrons on the left will flow in that direction. And they will continue to flow on the other side. So basically, what the battery does, using its voltage, which you can think of as an electromotive force, it basically pumps electrons from one side of the capacitor to the other side. And that's how it charges it. So over time, let me draw a new picture. Let's say if 200 electrons travel from one plate to the other plate. Let's see what the situation will be. So if the plate on the left loses 200 electrons, it now has 800. It started with 1,000, but it has 800. Now the number of protons is still the same. It's 1,000. The plate on the right gained 200 electrons, so now it has 1,200. But the protons are still the same. The protons don't move inside a metal. Now if you notice, the left side has a positive charge because it has 200 more protons than electrons. And the right side now has a negative charge. It has 200 more electrons than protons. So the magnitude of the charges on these two plates are equal, but the sign is opposite. So on the left side, the charge is positive Q. There's 200 more protons than electrons. On the right side, the charge is negative Q. There's 200 more electrons than protons. So the charges on these two plates will always be the same. It's just that the magnitude is different. Now, over time, the capacitor will be charged to a voltage that's equal to the voltage of the battery. So let's say at 12 volts, it has a charge of 200. Now, 200 electrons doesn't correspond to 200 coulombs, but let's just say the charge is 200 just to keep things simple. How much more charge can we store if we double the voltage? If we double the voltage, then we can store 400 units of charge as opposed to 200 units. If we triple the voltage, we can store 600. The capacitance is basically the ratio between how much uh, charge we can store and divided by the voltage level at that point. So if you were to divide 12 by 200, it's going to be equal to 12 over 400. You're going to get the same value. And that value, actually I did it the other way around, is supposed to be charge over uh, voltage. So if you divide 200 by 12, it's going to be equal to 400 over 24. And that ratio between the amount of charge that can be stored at a given voltage, that's equal to the capacitance of the capacitor. Just keep in mind though, this is not in clumps. That's just the difference in electrons and protons. In reality, to calculate C, you need to find a charge in clumps and then divide it by voltage. To do that, it's going to be uh, N times E. So basically, if you have 200 electrons, multiply it by 1.6 times 10 to negative 19, and then you can get the charge Q. Each electron has this charge. So just to review, a battery charges a capacitor by pumping electrons from one side of the capacitor to the other side. Now, once the capacitor is charged, what's going to happen if we remove the battery and connect it to something that can absorb energy, let's say a light bulb? And let's say the capacitor has enough energy to light up the light bulb. What's going to happen? So let's redraw the picture that we have. So this plate is positive, and the other plate is negative. Now, both plates still have about 1,000 protons, but the plate on the right has 1,200 electrons, and the one on the left is electron deficient. It has 800 electrons. So even though the plate is positively charged on the left, it doesn't mean that it doesn't contain electrons. It simply means that there are more protons than electrons. That's why it's positively charged. And the plate on the right, because it's negatively charged, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have any protons. It simply means that there's more electrons than protons. 
So when you're dealing with electric charge, think of it as the difference between the number of protons and electrons because all matter contains protons and electrons. Now, electrons are going to flow from the negatively charged plate towards the positively charged plate. And that's how a capacitor discharges itself. That's how it uses up its, its energy. Electrons are naturally attracted to protons. So if one side is negatively charged, the excess electrons will flow towards the side that is electron deficient or that has a positive charge. And as these electrons flow through the wires and through the light bulb, the light bulb is going to light up, provided that this capacitor has enough energy to get the job done. And so that's how a capacitor discharges itself. Now, the capacitor will stop working when the number of electrons are equal on both sides. So once 200 electrons flow through the light bulb, this will now be 1,000. And this will increase by 200, so it's going to be 1,000 now. At that point, the two plates are neutralized. They no longer have a charge. They have equal numbers of protons and electrons. So the charge on both plate is no longer positive Q and negative Q, but rather Q is going to be equal to zero since the number of electrons are the same and the protons are the same. So once it reaches a state of equilibrium, the capacitor is basically dead. It's discharged. Now, there are some other equations that you need to know before we begin doing some problems. And that is the electric potential energy stored in a capacitor. There's three equations that you need to know. The first one is 1 half QV. It's half of the charge times the voltage. Now, we know that Q is equal to CV. So if we replace Q with CV, we can get another equation. The electric potential energy stored in a capacitor is also equal to 1 half CV squared. So make sure you know these two equations, 1 half QV and 1 half CV squared. Now there's also another one. Because we can replace V with Q divided by C if you rearrange this equation. So instead of replacing Q, let's replace V now. So it's going to be uh, 1 half times Q times Q over C. So this equals Q squared divided by 2C. So those are the three equations that you need to know to calculate the potential energy stored in a capacitor.